Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson and welcome to Microsoft Project Made Easy. Today we're going to be looking at buffers. Uh, many of you probably looked this up because you're wondering how do I show a buffer in a schedule? And maybe what exactly is a buffer? Well, when we talk in project management terms, a buffer is a way of managing risk. Uh, you're putting a little bit extra into the schedule in case things don't go exactly as planned. In one of my other videos, I discuss Parkinson's law. And Parkinson's law basically says time is going to basic, basically take up what time you give to something. Uh, so we have to be a little bit cognizant of that when we develop schedules as well. There's a lot of complications and psychologies that goes into uh, schedule management. Microsoft Project is a tool, so um, what I'm going to show you today, just think of it from the tools perspective, and you want to look at and research a little bit more on project management itself to make sure that it makes sense what you're doing for you, your projects, and the stakeholders that are involved in your projects. So first off, you know, one way that you'll see that a lot of people think of buffers is, well, we want to finish, start here and we want to finish there and they start putting together their activities and you know doing the network and they might pad their activities. Padding basically means give extra time. So for example, if I think the site layout uh, takes two days, maybe I give it three or four days, you know? Uh, I'm gonna give it a little bit of extra time and that way it will um, give me some more flexibility later on. This particular example, of course, if you understand how the schedules work, is showing float, which means it already has a little bit of flexibility. But if it was a critical task item, like ones that are shown in red, and if you're not sure, sure how to show that in Microsoft Project, you just go under the format, critical task, that turns things on, turns it off. So you can see the actual critical path in your project, the longest path through the project. Any activity I do this to, it's going to change my finish day. It's going to add an extra day to my project. So I've just given an extra day to do this and then that's given me an extra day to finish the project. So if I'm originally developing this plan and I allocate extra time to the various activities, it's going to make my project take longer. But I might be thinking in my head, well, I've given myself some extra time on these activities so I can fit it in. I've given myself a buffer. This is not a great way of doing it. Because the problem is you're not even going to be sure how much extra time you've allocated to the different activities. And using Parkinson's law, if somebody thinks that they have six days to do something, that's likely going to take them six days to do it, when really it should have taken five days. So that's one of the psychological problems that you have. But this is what happens with a lot of schedules. People do uh, pad some of their activities or when you ask people how long is this going to take you, they give themselves a little bit of an extra comfort zone. The other problem with that is because after a while they don't even know how much things were padded, they actually end up consuming the full amount of time and then something else happens and it actually ends up running late. Uh, a better way to do this, uh, although uh, it's requiring more transparency, is to make it visual, to just say it's a buffer at certain points in time. Uh, whereas you have a heading here, substructure, and maybe for this area of work, you want to include a buffer. Well, what you could do is you could insert a row uh, above, you know, the, the summary task that's below it. And you could call this foundation buffer as an example. And you could say, I want to allocate a five day buffer here. So I'm going to put in five days. And so that's my duration. Of course, it's back at the start date. You would link it to the previous, the last task. So foundation inspection improved in that particular milestone grouping, that uh, work breakdown structure area. And I'm going to plug in number 28 there, which will give me a link. And that puts that buffer over here. Now, of course, that buffer doesn't mean anything unless I connect it to, instead of having this, these all connected to number 28, which is foundation inspection approved. I connect it with uh, 29 and I just put that in those three or four activities that I had there. And now that has given me this buffer. 
So, and it's also on the critical path and it's also changing um, my um, time frames if it's affecting the overall critical path. So if it's delaying things on the critical path, it's pushing that outward. So it's giving me that extra time period that I had here of um, five days. Now, to recap, I've inserted that row, which is foundation buffer, and it is now linked with row number 28. It's now brought that time period up here. And now what I wanna do is I wanna link the successor activities or what should be the successor activities to the buffer. So I am going to put in number uh, 29 here. And you notice when I put 29, it has basically changed my whole project schedule here. And so it's pushed that out. And it will do that for this one as well. Uh, this one, it won't do it because this now is not affecting the critical path. And this one, it won't do it because it's not affecting the critical path. Path. This was originally on the critical path, so that's having the most impact. What you're doing is you're, in essence, adding five days to your project. You're giving yourself that extra buffer. Now, if you're tracking your project, the advantage is when you update the schedule, it will push out the project, right? If you are delayed on these activities, and then you can look at the buffer and you can say, okay, well, it pushed it out four days or it pushed it out three days. I would still have some time period that I could reduce the buffer to get the time back during that time period. So this would be more what using sort of PMP uh, or PMI terminology um, would be putting in like a contingency risk, uh, contingency buffer. This is more for the things that when you have it under these kind of headings, they're more for the known unknowns. We kind of know this could happen. We kind of know this could happen. We want to have a little bit of flexibility. So you could put that kind of buffer at the end of a grouping of work, you know, perhaps to a, from one milestone to another, you could insert some buffers in there. And that would allow you some flexibility that if you fell behind on this and um, you didn't use the buffer up completely, you might not even have to reschedule the work that's succeeding on this, right? Like if you lost four or five days here, then this would just eventually roll right into this. Uh, so that would minimize the amount of rescheduling of work that you would have to do. So that's kind of, you could do that at different locations, depending on the work that you're doing and the amount of buffers that you need on the project. So underneath your work breakdown structures, you could add those rows. Now, what a lot of people won't like about this, particularly in construction is, well, I don't want my client to see this buffer in there, right? Because uh, they're going to just feel that it's free time. And there is some of that logic that does become problematic in some cases. And it depends on your contract models, your relationship with the clients. Like if this was integrated project delivery, IPD type project, very easy to do this because you're collaborating, everybody's sharing in the profit. There's a much more team uh, aspect in the scheduling process, very easy to do. Lump sum, a little bit more difficult to do. But I would say that this is much better in your dealings with your different trades because you could be just focusing in on these time periods with your trades. And this is at the end. Like this isn't necessarily for one particular trade or not. Uh, it's who uses it first uh, would tend to take up that time. It's really a way of managing your risk uh, from that perspective. The other thing you could do too is at the end of the project, you could also have a buffer inserted. So you can insert another task and you could call this project buffer. And this project buffer, so maybe, uh, let's see, we'll go project buffer. This project buffer, maybe you wanna allocate, you know, 15 days, right? And this would be extra time that you would have for the overall project. Uh, this would be more for, instead of the individual uh, line item buffers, this would be more for the unknown unknowns. This would be like a management contingency risk buffer that you would have that would be overarching of what other things that you kind of have known, like I said, known unknowns that are these little things that may occur. You may want to allow some of those buffers. You could even have those buffers be inclusive of bad weather days that may come up during that time period. So in other words, don't schedule something that would be like forming a first floor, 
make it six days allocating one day for bad weather. No, you make it the time period it's going to take. And at the end, you have uh, like at the end of the first floor, you have maybe a buffer or at the end of five floors, you have maybe five day buffer. So during that time period, maybe it was a five week period, maybe you do lose four or five days, but that could be taken up, absorbed from that other buffer. Meanwhile, you have your crews incentivized to do the work in the periods of time that the activities display. And it's much more real that way. And so I, I think what you lose in uh, the, the aspect of uh, a client knowing that this is a buffer and this is here for a, a purpose, uh, you gain in reality. If your workers and your teams find out that you're putting, you know, padding activities, then like I said, they're going to take that time up or they're not going to trust the time periods that you give them. So it's very useful to be transparent. This is the way we've planned this and to make sure that you have buy-in from the parties that are involved in the project. So in this particular case with the project buffer, I would put 104 here uh, as a, an example, and then I would scroll to task. So I'll go to the task tab here. I'll scroll to task. And then I would add this to the end of the milestone date. So I would have this at the very end and I would put this as 105. And then basically as time gets absorbed in our buffer periods, I would have them utilized up. So in other words, with this uh, buffer here, uh, if we were running late, so I would have to have had this set as a baseline I'm just going to do this quickly. If you want to look at my other videos on how to properly update a file and recover a file and in detail, um, I have that on my playlist. So click subscribe, check the playlist, the Microsoft Project playlist, and you can see videos for pretty much any area of Microsoft Project that you're interested in. So I'm going to go to the project tab here and I'm going to set the baseline just very quickly. And remember, setting the baseline means it's taking a snapshot so we can see uh, what changes have occurred. And let's say, for example, uh, let's say that form uh, foundation walls took se seven days, right? So form foundation walls took seven days. And of course, you know, I would have updated these that they're 100% done. And I would have done that in the tracking screen where I would have put in actual dates but like I said I won't do that quite now so we'll do a little bit of the the quick way of reviewing it I'm going to go to my tracking Gantt and take a look at what it shows so I'm going to go to the tracking Gantt going to go to the foundation buffer uh, scroll to task and I can see that this delay that occurred right at this point this extra two days has pushed my project out by um, that two days, two working days. Well, what I could do at that point, right? I, I had a buffer in here. I could utilize some of that buffer back here. So I've pulled back three days for this, this um, contingency buffer in this area of work. So I've absorbed that shock of that. If I'm able to, uh, you know, finish this, go all through all of these at that point and get it back on time that would be great you know then I've, I've gained some and then i might want to pull everything up that's going to be giving me more time and then at a certain point as we approach uh, closer to the end of the project we could state that we're going to actually come in early with the project if that's the case but this is one of the ways that you're just controlling it at different points in time with uh, the contingency buffers and you can have an overarching like i said amount for the project buffer that would be for these like things that just throw you right off you know it could be some some major change design error or something that that has a major impact but at least you have something that you can absorb that uh, within and that can be helpful so this is how you can manage buffers in Microsoft uh, project using the transparent method the other way, of course, that I could have uh, also mentioned is that you could put a lag on an activity. So instead of you know me putting a separate row here as a foundation buffer, I could have just had foundation inspection approved and then I could have had a lag of five days to these activities here, which would have just 
given me that that extra time it wouldn't show necessarily as a separate line item that says buffer on it and some people like that because then the client's not going to ask what's that buffer oh we can do this 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 or the consultant uh with that i think you're better to be much more transparent at the beginning this is what we're doing this is how we've scheduled this is how we've got a little bit of allocation for extra room and then beyond that, we're always tracking and we're making sure that we're documenting things so that if things go beyond that, we want to know what's causing it beyond that. Uh, so that's what I wanted to cover with buffers. Hopefully that answered uh, your questions uh, on that topic. Uh, this is videos actually as a response to somebody asking me a question if I could do a, an example of how buffers can be used in construction. And that would be my suggestion to be transparent with it, to have contingency buffers and to have a management reserve buffer to better manage risks on your project, uh, as opposed to padding activities. And uh, next to that is where you have a lag time. And just, just a quick uh, to show you the lag time, just in case some of you, what's he talking about a lag time? Lag time, all I mean is that you've given uh, extra by putting a lag time, I double clicked on uh, the arrow here and then I could put a four day lag and that stretches that out. If I started with a lag time, then I could always shorten that on that activity later on. And I'd have to remember that those buffers are in place for that purpose too. And I maybe ask questions of why you got a lag time between the inspections and this and that. So that's why I'm saying you might as well just be transparent with it. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this short video. I'm Tom Stevenson. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, please click subscribe or if you've got ideas or questions for other videos, put it in the comments. If you uh, manage your uh, projects differently with regards to buffers, please tell us how you actually do it. It helps to build the community and how effective it is uh, in implementing it. So again, I'm Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.